In this session two, we'll cover the notion of stochastic inversion. We return to our full Bayesian formulation. In full Bayesian formulation, we stated that the posterior distribution can be written as a product of a prior distribution and likelihood distribution. And so now we're dealing more explicitly uh, with this particular formulation. In particular, we're going to look at formulations of how we can uh, how we can formulate the prior distribution uh, when dealing with uh, subsurface systems. And so there, what will be very important is to look at uh, geological information. After all, uh, even before we acquire data, we know something about subsurface in particular, say, if we're dealing with certain depositional uh, systems. The idea here is also then to uh, create samples from the posterior distributions rather than, say, calculate some kind of a maximum of the posterior distribution, which was done in deterministic inversion. Just a quick reminder is that uh, deterministic inversion uh, was a specific case of the Bayesian uh, formula. So we used the Bayesian formula. We um, essentially assigned often Gaussian distributions. Uh, we did either linear or nonlinear optimization, and we obtained a single solution. And so the single solutions are, of course, a very smoother version of reality. To show that, uh, here's a specific example of the Danish groundwater management uh, example we have in the book. So here we have, uh, on the top here, we have our SkyTem survey, uh, which uh, shows uh, clearly that there are these buried valleys. Uh, and then we asked the geologist uh, to describe those buried valleys. And if you look at that, we see much more complexity than the geology that can be seen from the geophysics. Uh, for example, we notice that some of these, uh, uh, these buried valleys are filled with clay, that there is internal hygiene in those, in those valleys, that there are certain rules um, of one valley cutting another valley, etc. So if we are then going to build uh, groundwater models, then of course we have to use both cases or both data. So then the question is, how do we do that? It's not a trivial case, uh, simply because the geophysical data does not image uh, a lot of the geological details. And uh, this picture here that we have is just basically a conceptual rendering. It's not an actual model. So how do we turn all that information into actual quantitative uh, models and prior distributions? And that would be a very important part of the stochastic inversion uh, for the subsurface. So we'll talk about the geological prior model. But to understand that, uh, we have to realize that the subsurface often is modeled through uh, three different components. There is the layering and faulting of the subsurface, which are the structures. Then there's the rocks that are contained within those layers, and then the fluid which are contained within those rocks. So uh, typically, the, the subsurface structure are obtained from uh, either drilling or geophysical data. For example, we can make interpretations of, uh, of stratigraphic service from seismic data or faults uh, from seismic data, and by that we build uh, a structural model. Because the interpretation of the seismic data or the seismic data itself is uncertain, there will be uncertainty on the, on the structural model being generated. If we have a structural model, then we'd like to uh, create rock properties within that structural model. But the problem, however, is to do this practically. The problem we have in reality is that we have, if we have faults and layers, we have a quite uh, co a complicated physical domain. Our physical domain is it's not simply some simple stratigraphic, uh, some simple Cartesian grid. Uh, which can then fill with uh, pixels, basically, which can fill with properties. We often have to deal with uh, complex uh, situations. So this is a quite simple situation, but you can imagine in this more complex situation that things get more difficult. So in order to handle the situation, what often is done is to uh, either unfold or unfold, uh, or just transform the whole system into what is called the depositional uh, coordinates. So in this depositional coordinates, we basically remove everything that happened post-deposition, post, post uh, and particularly some of the structures, except for maybe since sedimentary structures, most of the structures uh, did occur after uh, the deposition. And so if we can move that into these coordinates, then we can do our modeling uh, of properties and of rocks and, and fluids in this, uh, what is called depositional domain. And then after that is done, we can map it back into this uh, original physical domain or stratigraphic domain. So that by itself is not a simple process, and there's uh, there are some methods to do that, uh, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but obviously, when you have a very complex um, structural setting with possibly tens to hundreds of faults, you can imagine that this mapping is not a simple exercise in itself. 
um, you know, may require some, some work. Often we see inverse problems um, that have been solved in other domains being applied, applied to a geologic context. There's nothing wrong with that, except of course that in the geologic context, we have a, a difficult situation that involves geological rules. In other words, we just don't deal with pixel values or, or simple uh, parameters. Our parameters often have complicated relationships. And these relationships are simply induced by the fact that we have to be dealing with the geological uh, depositional system that created several uh, rules within the subsurface. Here's just a few examples of those uh, of those rules. For example, uh, on the right hand side here, we see um, a canyon of a turbidite deposit where we see very specific shapes emerging. emerging. These are sh channel shapes, so this is a, a depth section. And within those, uh, that canyon, we see then uh, stacking of individual canyons, and then within those, we see stacking of individual uh, uh, channels. And so uh, the way this is stacking proceeds, the way uh, these things form, of course, are constrained to a certain geological process understanding. And so um, if we are modeling a system like this, then we'd like to inject rules that are related to the system. When it comes down to faults, of course, uh, we have the same issue. Uh, for example, if I have a fault in my system, then I have to deal with what's called the fault throw. That means that uh, some part of on the, on the, on the uh, one side of the fault, things may have moved up and down, and the same thing on the other part. And that amount of movement to fault throw is often interpreted, and there have to be some constraints on those. Uh, the other thing, for example, simple uh, constraint is that layers cannot cross faults, um, simply because faulting was created after the layer. So there's all these constraints that make it very difficult to create automatically these systems. Here we see a, a, a porphyry copper deposit and we see various age relationships. Uh, so this is a, a, it's a horizontal slice through this uh, porphyry copper deposit and see we this intricate uh, nesting of various uh, lithologies where one is older than the other one. And so if you want to model these lithologies, we have to account for their age relationship. Here see uh, this looks a little funny, but this is abandoned eye information. This is probably only a meter or so long. But what we see in here, which is also typical in geology, is that something is nested into something else. So for example, we see uh, that the pink is nested within this, within this gray, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a special relationship between the black and the orange. So if we're going to model these kind of systems, then of course we have to make sure that we account for these uh, nesting and age relationships. A particularly difficult case uh, is structural uncertainty. And here on the left-hand side, we just see an overview of the various approaches that have been uh, dealt with. Um, and particularly, faults are, uh, of course, very important in many cases, are important in storage, um, important um, in, of course, oil and gas reservoirs, uh, mineral deposits, uh, geothermal systems, etc. So here we see it's just an overview of, of the various ways um, these systems were represented. And so we go from very simple uh, cases of uh, representing faults using uh, disks to eventually, uh, of course, understanding that we cannot see all the faults in the in the of the imputation that we are making, for example, in the seismic data, that they're missing faults to uh, cases where we uh, have difficult fault intersections. For example, here on the right hand side, we see rather complicated fault intersections. And so uh, there are many possible interpretations. Uh, here we see normal faulting, and so uh, these, this system is topologically very different uh, from this system. So if there's uncertainty on the topology, then of course that will be very difficult uh, to handle itself, uh, simply because we can just transition from a normal faulting system to this uh, other Y faulting uh, system here. So structural uncertainty is still uh, quite difficult uh, to handle, and a lot has to do with the fact of the representation of the faults through objects. So the other issue, of course, is that uh, we have structural uncertainty for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that we don't have a perfect understanding uh, how faults interact, and there may be multiple interpretations, but also the data on which the interpretations are made uh, may be subject to significant uh, noise. Here's a good example of that. We see here uh, a case uh, this is in Japan, uh, the Nankai Trough. Uh, we see a nice, on the top part, we see nice features occurring, folds and faulting. That's easy to interpret, the same here. Uh, 
But once you go deeper, you notice that it all becomes much more murkier. And so uh, we know there is an equal amount of fault in, in SEER because, for example, we know that this is essentially a similar depositional system with a simple uh, tectonic history. So essentially, we expect also an amount of holding to happen here, but we just don't see it. Uh, that's not because they're not present, it's because of the nature of the seismic acquisition doesn't allow to easily to image that part of the subsurface in here that has something to do with hydrates. Um, and so that's a big uh, problem. How do we then uh, represent the structural uncertainty in this part, in particular, the prior structural uncertainty? Uh, if you're just going to rely on data and just do deterministic inverse modeling, then we're coming up with one solution with way too many, way too few faults. And so uh, the prior distribution is just one particular way of including uh, this kind of information in, into, into the inversion. There are certain cases where we can actually understand the prior information from uh, the data itself. And this is typical for geostatistics. In geostatistics, we look at uh, some information. Uh, for example, we have some samples from a reference truth. This is what, what is shown over here. So these are samples of reference truth. And what we then try to do is to estimate the spatial covariance, uh, the degree of correlation that we see in this uh, reference truth. And so once we have understanding of that, so this are will be estimating a function like that. I apologize here for the lack of, um, of axes. So this is the distance and this is the covariance. Uh, then once we understand that, then we can generate models uh, that have that particular uh, spatial covariance and also constraint to the data. So this would be then uh, conditional realizations and the, these conditional realizations, they're constrained to the data. They reflect some of the spatial correlation that is present. These are then uh, called samples of the prior distribution. This idea of estimating the spatial covariance from data, is, however, has some uh, considerable limitations. Take, for example, a case here where we see three different uh, models created of the subsurface. And let's say we calculate the covariance of each of those models. So we have something that uh, looks a little noisy, something that has, uh, has ellipses and something that has channels. If you calculate the spatial covariance of all these models, they are exactly the same. Uh, it basically means that the spatial covariance is only represent a very limited uh, representation of actual spatial variability. And so uh, in order then, well, if, if you want to then use a spatial covariance model, essentially what you're getting uh, is something more, which is essentially the first picture here. So you will get this picture. So despite the fact that reality looks like this, what you will generate with these models is something more like this. So in other words, the prior uh, distribution or the prior uncertainty model um, is not a very realistic representation of actual uncertainty and variability in the subsurface. Here's another example. Um, this is more for minerals. We see here, for example, that uh, we have an ore body uh, above uh, something that's not ore and that therefore is con considered waste. Here we have a very different ore body. We see much more irregularity in the surface. And so for a mining company, this is very important to know. However, if you calculate the variogram in the various uh, X and Y directions, you will see essentially no difference. So this is the same as in the previous slide. So if you see topological changes, uh, in, in the system, the geometries become very different, then um, our variogram, our x direction, y direction, or our variogram still remain the same. So in other words, if you would actually have limited sample data, you would not know whether you're in this case or that case, and that's a big problem. So one of the solutions that was proposed is to use training images. And training images, what we're doing is essentially decoupling a little bit uh, this idea of extracting the uh, spatial correlation from data and just specify the spatial correlation exhaustively with an image. So here we see, uh, for example, that we have some sample data of three categories. Uh, somebody provides an idea of um, the kind of geological structure that are present. Uh, and the many ways of, of generating that, we'll go into that. But in, in this particular case, for example, we see that uh, we have the red has to be uh, covered by the green and, and then we have the blue should not touch uh, much of the red. And so uh, if I generate then uh, prior model realizations constrained to this data, uh, then I would like to honor that kind of geological rule that I've imposed. So this is the same, for example, in the Danish groundwater case. Uh, we have some kind of uh, geological model that is presented to us, uh, which are the buried valleys, which have certain ways of intersecting with each other. And then we can generate many realizations with different kind of uh, intersections that are happening at these locations. So these are, again, uh, realization of the prior uh, model. 
in, in this case represented through the Trinity image. Uh, another form of uh, generating prior distributions is through measure of our objects. So when we talk about objects, we can talk about many things. Here we see, for example, uh, we see a feature which is scour features in a uh, in a uh, braided river system terrain, uh, which is um, relevant for groundwater management in many cases in the world. And so what we get are we get these sort of scour features, uh, the scooping out, let's say, of the river into the into the sediments and creating these various features. Uh, faults are another way of uh, an example of um, object-based priors. And so in these object-based priors, we have risen have actually two issues or, or two param model parameterization. First of all, we have to parameterize the shape of the object, and that could be the kind of shape you have. For example, I have an ellipse, uh, and if you have an ellipse or a half ellipsoid, uh, then I need to specify orientation, the axis, major axis, minor axis. So you have a, a set of parameters uh, that are then uncertain. What's also uncertain, of course, is the placement and the rules of placement. For example, objects may attract each other, may uh, may be randomly distributed. So there's another issue related to how you would place the ob objects. So for prior for faults, um, it's a, it's even more complicated because now instead of just placing objects, you have also rules between objects. So you see that the blue uh, faults have different uh, size distributions than the red faults. And also the blue faults um, were created uh, first and the red faults were created uh, second because they terminate on these uh, on these faults. Uh, and so all these have to go into uh, some kind of object-based uh, prior, which is a mathematical model uh, of the prior distribution now described by objects. Okay, now that we have the various ways of representing geologic information into prior distribution, let's see how this now all fits into an inverse problem. So here I have a particular inverse problem where I have uh, a groundwater uh, system, uh, which consists of channels. And so we have essentially various, uh, we pump at this location here. Uh, we have a pumping well, let's put on the pointer. So here we have a pumping well and we observe the head uh, drop after uh, a while at these particular locations. So this, of course, the drop in, in the water level is going to depend on, on the channel formation. Uh, we clearly, clearly don't have to deal, we're not clearly not dealing with a homogeneous model. And so uh, that means that in addition, uh, we don't know this reference truth, but somebody has provided us with some idea of what the truth would look like. Uh, in this case, it would be a training image uh, model. And so once I have a training image, I can generate many realizations. And the question now is, can I create essentially a realization uh, that's not just reflecting of the training image, but also is constrained to the, 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 the head drop here. So if you would do deterministic inversion, you would specify the prior model as, as the flow simulation and, uh, and the, uh, the data variables would be uh, the head drop at these uh, nine locations. And if you do that, then you get something that looks like this. So again, we get something that's um, essentially very smooth. It doesn't at all represent the, uh, the, the channel formations that, that are known to exist in the subsurface. For example, we see here the way the further you go away from data, uh, the less uh, accurate our result becomes. And, and plus you have essentially only one solution. And even if you would have a confidence interval on the solution, it would not reflect at all that the, 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 the possible presence of these channel formations. So let's first look at the prior model distribution. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that training image and generate essentially uh, a, a large set of, of, of realizations. Uh, and all these realizations, they don't match any of the information. They just represent um, essentially uh, the geologic understanding of, of the system. If I then calculate uh, some averages, so I run flow simulation on all these prior distributions, then I get uh, an ensemble average that is here AI. It's basically the mean, the average of all the models. So because there's no information in the models, uh, that average is simply a constant. Uh, of course, I'm pumping here, so I do get a, uh, uh, an, a pressure uh, change in, the, in all of the models, which is due to pumping, and then also have some kind of a groundwater flow, as you notice here. And here we see the standard deviation of the pressure. So uh, we almost see no, no standard deviation of the pressure, except perhaps on the, on the boundaries uh, of the model. Okay, so the, 
if you want to use base rule and uh, do inversion, the, possibly one of the simplest uh, techniques available is approximate base computation, or also called ABC. So in ABC, um, what we'd like to do is to essentially create models uh, that reflect some prior understanding and also match our observations. So it's also called a method of uh, likelihood-free inversion. We're not going to specify a likelihood distribution. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to specify a distance. So the way it works is extremely simple. What we'll do is we'll dry, uh, we, we draw a model from our prior distributions. That's already been done. We've seen that in the previous slides. Then we simulate the data uh, using our forward model that gives us a data response. Then we'd like to compare that with the actual data. So we have to calculate the distance, the distance between the simulated data and the observed data. And then we simply ac accept M if that distance is less than some specified threshold. So that seems good. Of course, what we need to do is, is to first specify this distance. Uh, and that may be some of an issue because D could potentially be very high dimensional. So we may want to resort to some summary statistics. The other thing is that our epsilon has to be very, very, very small. And as a result, of course, that uh, our rejection rate may be very high. So typically, you may accept only a few percentage points or even less uh, of the models. So why is this now called approximate based computation? Well, if we'd like to match our data uh, accurately uh, or perfectly, then, of course, uh, we're making an approximation simply because we're uh, saying that there's some threshold epsilon uh, beyond which uh, we need to make uh, we accept models. And so in that sense, uh, the approximate distribution or that uh, approximation that is being made is, is essentially we're sampling now from this distribution, which is sampled from the prior distribution. And then basically uh, we accept according to some indicator function. Uh, and so uh, if epsilon uh, goes to zero, then this becomes essentially a spike function, and it would just select models that are perfectly matching um, our observation. This is just a mathematical representation of saying that uh, we are making an approximation to the actual posterior distribution. If we do that, uh, then, um, then we get what is called posterior models. So now these are models that are drawn from the posterior distribution, no longer models from drawn from the prior distribution. And so here we see these various models. And in addition, here we see how well that model matches our data. So uh, on, the, on this axis, we see have the data. And here is the predicted data. So we, we see that that lies on a 45 degree line. Remember that I have essentially uh, nine measurements here, which are the head measurements uh, at those various locations. So now we can make some summary statistics around uh, this. Uh, for example, here we see the, uh, the uh, probability of channel occurring, right? Because I just uh, I've basically now calculate an average of this discrete variable. So channel occurring means black, which is one. Channel not occurring, sorry, channel occurring uh, means white. Uh, channel not occurring means black. And so essentially we get a probability of channel occurring uh, which sort of looked like our deterministic uh, solution. Um, and here uh, we see um, the ensemble standard deviation out of the pressure field. And we see that uh, because of our information about the head data that our uncertainty on the pressure distribution has now, uh, has now significantly uh, decreased with regard to uh, the prior. Uh, and of course, in addition, we get all the models that were in the previous slide. Uh, and so if you're going to do then forward predictions for predicting some H, uh, w which could be anything, then I would use the posterior models and run some future scenario on those uh, to make predictions. Approximate Bayesian computation is not an efficient method simply because it just jumps around in the model space uh, randomly. In other words, if it would be finding higher likelihood areas, it would just ignore those areas and just keep jumping around. A more uh, a better approach to uh, such sampling is called the Metropolis sampler, and it's one of the many methods for Markov chain Monte Carlo method uh, sampling. So in the Metropolis sampling, uh, we start from some initial model, which is drawn from the prior distribution. And then uh, there's a second step, which is now a proposal uh, of a new model. So there's a, uh, going to be a proposal distribution where we draw basically a new model from uh, essentially uh, a distribution that is, that is a conditional distribution involving the previous model. What it's basically saying is that instead of jumping around randomly, now we're going to make uh, small changes or some amount of changes into the model 
uh, and then evaluate uh, what those changes mean. So it, it, the metropolis sample does not necessarily uh, state how these changes should, should be made, and that that's, uh, has to be determined for each individual case. But imagine we have uh, a new model, which is some deviation or change or perturbation from the previous model. What are we going to do with that new model? Well, what we do is we evaluate the uh, likelihood distribution of that uh, new model, uh, or the likelihood data under that new model, and the likelihood of the data under the, uh, the previous model. And so then there is an, an acceptance step that we say that we're going to accept this new model with ratio alpha. So obviously what that means is that if our new model is an improved likelihood uh, distribution uh, or likelihood uh, density, then we're going to accept that new model. If not, then uh, there's still a probability of accepting a model that has less likely, likelihood, uh, and that probability is alpha. So the way it's implemented simply on a computer is that we draw a random number and check that random number is less or equal than alpha, uh, and then we accept that with, with that probability. What it allows us to do, of course, is that, uh, first of all, we don't get stuck somewhere uh, in an area. We allow ourselves um, uh, to, to improve, to um, Essentially, the likelihood with the likelihood increase, we allow ourselves to have models that have less uh, that are less likely than than the existing model, and so this is a way of moving around in the same in the sampling space uh, that is a more systematic than the uh, the approximate based computation that we've seen before. So this all sounds uh, really nice on paper, uh, but of course it is, doesn't necessarily, as I mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily provide a specific implementation. It's just a general framework. Of doing things, and so each uh, each application will have to then uh, make, be more specific about what are these proposal distributions, and what are then good acceptance rates. So one of the things uh, that that is um, critical in Markov chain Monte Carlo is issue of convergence. So unlike uh, the the essentially the approximate base computation or simply sampling from a distribution where we using the inverse uh, CDF method, uh, where we get just an answer, and, and we do Monte Carlo, we go and get another, another sample, another answer. So here we're sampling iteratively. So uh, the, basically what I've shown in the previous slide is sort of conceptualized here. So imagine this is your model space, and this is a high likelihood uh, region. So what the Metropolis sampler will do is, it doesn't jump around randomly. So if you see that the next model, if this is your initial model, then the next model will be dependent on the initial model. It's not just that you're jumping around randomly, which is what you do with approximate based computation. So uh, then after a while, of course, we're finding highly likelihood areas. However, what we don't do is we, uh, we don't just get stuck here. That would happen uh, if we all only accept models that have improved likelihood. Instead, we're keeping uh, walking around in this area and thereby sampling the posterior distribution. The problem, of course, with this is that uh, we have to wait a while. So uh, in the simple 2D cartoon, uh, it's clear that we get here and it's fine. But in a high dimensional problem, we don't really know where we end up and, and how, how long we have to wait from the initial model until we end up in a, in a good region. So we have to monitor that uh, progress. Then the other problem with this is that unlike Monte Carlo, where you get independent samples, uh, now essentially uh, we have dependent sampling. So that's fine, but that also means that the effective sample size is much less uh, than in a Monte Carlo, simply because uh, you have samples that are, are, are very similar to each other, rather than Monte Carlo, where you, you randomly jump around in that space, and so you get quickly a diversity uh, of samples. So you have the sample, uh, you have to walk around uh, long enough in order to sample from the posterior distribution. So in the paper we wrote last year on quantifying structural uncertainty, we bring many of these elements together. So this is a paper where we look at how do we construct prior distributions from, uh, from information, geological information, rules, etc. Uh, and then how do we sample uh, according to some available information? That means formulating a likelihood distribution and then doing Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample the posterior distribution. Okay, so here's the particular problem. Uh, we have we're an area here um, in uh, the Nankai Trough. This is near Japan, and so in the area we have uh, basically seismic data. So this here we see a, a cross section of the seismic data. And if you notice here in this area, we have a very nice visible structure. We see nice layering, and we can interpret faults. Here is the same. We see a nice uh, layering, and we see Y faults here, and so on. Uh, 
But the problem, of course, in reality is that uh, when we're looking at a target zone, so a target reservoir zone, and this is zoomed in here a little bit, we don't see much. And so uh, what we can do is to make some partial interpretations. So then uh, geophysicists will look at this, make some partial interpretations, say here they find four faults. But of course we know that there are many more faults there, simply because if you just look at the areas above, uh, we see which are structurally similar, actually this uh, structurally similar to that area, uh, then uh, we, can, we may have many different uh, faults. For example, we see here one Y fault, so we expect many more of these Y faults available uh, that, that are present, sorry there. So the question therefore is, uh, if you're going to do um, use this uh, for production, then we like to know how many faults there are and our uncertainty. Uh, we also don't know the length of the fault because we basically get only a partial interpretation of, we don't know how far this extends. Um, we want to quantify uncertainty on the location of faults. And then we want to know what the effect of faults have on some uh, property of interest. And here we're looking at compartmentalization. For example, here you notice that these two faults uh, create a compartment, and these compartments uh, are important to, to be uh, ca characterized simply because it will affect production out of the system. So conceptually, uh, ideas of faulting and tensional regime is that we get, uh, and this is uh, essentially something we'd like to get an idea on, just to have some more constraints on our prior uh, modeling and our prior uncertainty model is that get weakening in the rock, and that weakening in the rock leads to more fault in that particular area. Um, <clears throat> and then another area weakens, and then you get more fault in those areas. And then uh, there may be a change in stress, uh, which then uh, leads to a secondary faulting. And those secondary faulting, of course, they end on these primary faults. And so uh, you notice that we have a number of rules that are now being uh, described. First of all, uh, we know that, uh, that these faults are clustered. That's rule number one. However, within a cluster, uh, individual faults are, are always at a certain distance from each other. And that has to do, of course, with the fact that once I have breakage in an area, I'm not going to get a second breakage in that same area. And then we notice that, uh, that these red faults are, of course, attracted to, uh, to these uh, black faults. And so we have to also uh, take that into account. So this is not necessarily a model, but it's a conceptualization of, of, of what kind of properties our model should be capturing in the, in the prior uncertainty. So this is sort of summarizes that. Uh, we under have some understanding of technical physical processes. Um, we uh, can make uh, observations in areas uh, that are um, essentially above or, or areas where we have good interpretation. Uh, from that, we have built a conceptual model that was shown in the previous slide, um, where we can get also full uh, geometry distributions from these partial from these interpretations that we have in all areas, and that's something we'll show in a bit. And then, of course, uh, we need to take this conceptual model, which is the previous slide, and make it mathematical. And so there, often, we will be using point processes, and particularly more point processes uh, models. So, and that will then lead to a structural prior model. And this is our, uh, also our observations there over here. So uh, a fault numerical model is simply an object. An object is described by several parameters. Uh, first of all, an object is has described by a location of the object, so that's some coordinate. And then various parameters, uh, which are, for example, the, the dip, the azimuth, um, and the roughness of the surface. So here we see two faults with, uh, that are explicitly represented. So there are many ways to represent faults, and uh, one way is just explicit. So what is typically done is people make interpretations from uh, some data, typically geophysical data, and create point sets, and then they create surfaces based on those point sets. And those are typically triangulated uh, surfaces. So then if you have two surfaces, then you have, may have two point sets. For example, here you have the blue and the red point set. And so if we know that the, uh, the red fault is older than the blue fault, uh, then of course we also know that this point set is essentially uh, invalid. Um, and so that will be just due to interpretation uncertainty. So the way that it is done is we make surfaces with the two point sets, and then we truncate one surface onto it on top of the other surface, and we, we get the end result. The problem, of course, with this approach is when you have many faults, and you have many truncations, and you have very complicated modeling, uh, and so making those interpretations becomes complicated, making the triangulations become very complicated, and also uh, honoring the several rules that are, uh, that are there, such as, you know, the blue part cannot exist here, um, it's very challenging. So therefore, another method of doing that is called an implicit method. 
So the implicit method, instead of representing the fault as a surface, we're going to model it with a function, and the function being here, the distance to the fault. So you could see that uh, I can make a 3D uh, Cartesian box here. In the Cartesian box, I have basically cells, and those cells, they contain the distance to a surface. Uh, we do, a, however, do a trick. Instead of doing the distance, we, call, we do what's called the sign distance, which means that if you're on one side of the fault, your distance is positive. If you're on the other side of the fault, your distance is negative. That's just to keep track of where on which side of the fault that you are. It doesn't really matter whether this is positive or negative. You just have to have a difference. And so now what we have is essentially we have just all the information stored in a Cartesian grid. If I want to uh, find a fault, I would just have to do some simple interpolation uh, and, and grid the fault if I would need to grid the fault. So if we now have two faults, then we have two of these Cartesian uh, boxes. And so then I can calculate intersections. And this calculation of the intersection is very simple. I simply trunk away, uh, truncate away. So imagine this is not as the fault, and I know this fault here is younger. So here is that fault surface because that's the zero contour, right? So remember green here is the zero contour and is the, represents the surface. And so what I do is I take this distance function, truncate this part away, and I uh, simply uh, calculate the essentially the, uh, the surface at the zero contour and make that intersection. So um, this is really nice because we can also easily move a fault up. For example, if I move the fault up a little bit in this direction, it just means that I take a different contour. Uh, and I can then re repeat the operation. I don't have to move explicitly triangles in space uh, to do that. So uh, then we can uh, finally come to our prior model of uncertainty. Our prior model of uncertainty has sort of two components, of course, because we have a spatial part and we have also a, a, a global parameter part. This is basically similar as in, say, lithology or our properties. You always have some kind of global parameters and, and some kind of uh, local spatial distribution. So here, the local spatial distribution is simply by picking our faults. If I want to, if this is will be some numerical model that I have in my mind, then the way I present this um, essentially mathematically is by uh, listing all the the locations of those faults. So now we we, as you notice, we turn our um, uh, our our fault system into points, and also we have parameters that are associated with those points, such as the dip, roughness. Uh, azimuth, etc. And then of course, we have relationships between those. So uh, the way of representing this, uh, we've heard in the class already about Poisson process, which is simply the arrangement of points randomly in space. So now we have, in addition to the Poisson process, we have attached to each point, we have properties. So that's why we call this the mark point process. So this mark point process has many representations. Uh, the marks could be independent of the points, so that means there's a random distribution uh, between them, or the marks can actually depend on the points, and that's of course what we have here, is that we have always a point of a, uh, of, uh, a younger fault that's associated with a point of an older fault. And so the mark point process uh, idea, which is a mathematical idea, allows you to model that. We're not going to go into details of the mark point process, that's not uh, the, the, the topic of this course, uh, but the paper contains a lot of information around that. Okay, so uh, now we are ready. Once we've defined our, our numerical model, our distributions, we can actually do unconditional fault simulations. Those are basically generating the points in space, which is similar in front of mark point process marks, and then, uh, sorry, points, and then we have various properties that we simulate according to several distributions. Okay, so now I've defined our prior model of uncertainty. We uh, have a method of generating many prior uh, fault models. So what about now then uh, the data? And, uh, and this now comes to the falsification step. We have to test our prior model with some observations. Here it's a little bit more complicated because our data are essentially only partial observations. So it'd be very difficult to compare these partial observations with, um, uh, with the prior model because the prior model contains is a full representation of, of, of the faults that could be available and their properties. And so our data is only a partial interpretation. So we, we are a little bit comparing apples and oranges if we would be doing that. So uh, one way of circumventing that problem is to take our partial fault interpretations um, and, do an, uh, and do an initial uh, interpretation. So this is actually what people would do uh, in reality. They would say, I extend the faults in, into several directions, uh, make sure I create contacts, and so I have only four faults in this process. And so then I have essentially a one interpretation, 
And then I can turn that into a point processor representation. Remember that this is a, a primary faults, uh, so they have blue dots, and this is the secondary faults, they have red dots. So now I have basically this uh, prior and uh, this interpretation, and then now I'm going to use this to falsify my Prada model. In other words, what I'm going to do is generate many uh, models, um, structural models, just drawing from my prior distribution. That's something we've did before, and then comparing them. Uh, the comparing this here with all these prior distribution models. And so the methods of comparison I will be doing uh, using is, of course, the modified hazard distance because we're dealing with uh, shapes and objects. And so the modif modified hazard distance being the Euclidean distance of shapes is a very appropriate uh, method for comparison. So once I've done that modified hazard distance, I can map uh, everything in a, using multi-dimensional scaling in a low dimensional representation. See here we get a really nice lower dimensional representation. Uh, we have almost 40% here, 22% there. And so we notice these are our various fault models. So if, for example, uh, I can have actually fault models with one fault, uh, up to fault models with many faults. And so here also we have um, our uh, prior interpretation. So you notice that uh, we are capturing really well those uh, that initial um, uh, representation, um, and so that initial interpretation. And so uh, we're confident that are uh, going forward with our uh, prior model of uncertainty. Okay, so next then comes uh, uncertainty reduction. Uh, so in uncertainty reduction, if we're going to do inverse modeling, we have to calculate uh, do a likelihood formulation. And so here we're going to really uh, use this distance function or this level set function in that sense. Imagine that you have some partial interpretation. So this is actually our observation. And you would like to, to compare that with an existing fault network. Uh, what we can, uh, it's difficult to compare that. We could use a modified hazard distance, but still it would be difficult to compare. And, and so one way of doing that is actually look at the, at the level sets. For example, if, if you have a fault in this direction, then of course this fault in this direction is highly mismatching with my partial interpretation. If I have a fault in this direction, although I may be slightly misaligned, um, I have a really good, um, essentially, uh, have a really good uh, uh, mismatch, um, which is very low because it's close to that fault. So the way we can do that is simply by calculating the mismatch between the price structure and the, and the entire level set, just calculating essentially uh, the total sort of distance that we have uh, over this uh, point set and compared to here. So that will provide us with some level of mismatch. So in this case, we get a high mismatch. Here we get a low mismatch. So now we return to the likelihood formulation. So what's typically done in these uh, problems is to actually use a likelihood distribution, a full distribution, but a likelihood function. So what's this likelihood function? Well, a likelihood function uh, here is simply uh, taking the mismatch in the previous page, uh, which is called root mean square and error or some kind of mismatch, and turn that into a, a function, which is this exponential function here. Uh, so what, what we do with this function is that if you have a certain mismatch, it can calculate for us the likelihood function. So this likelihood function then uh, can be seen uh, as a way to calculate that ratio alpha. So obviously, if I have a model that is improving my likelihood, then that ratio is larger than one. If that model is, is not improving, so my initial model is here, my second model is there, then I'm essentially decreasing uh, the likelihood, but I can still accept a model with certain probability, which is a ratio of these two likelihood functions. So this then goes into uh, the Metropolis sampler. And so what we have defined now is the prior distribution, great. Uh, we have defined our likelihood function, calculates our ratio. What we haven't defined yet is the proposal distribution. It essentially means that if I have a current model, uh, how do I generate the next model depending on the previous model? And that's also why, of course, we call it a Markov chain. So to do that, we have to be smart. Uh, we want our, uh, essentially, our, there are many sort of restrictions there. One of the restrictions is that our proposal distribution needs to be symmetric. What it actually means is that if I go from a certain model M star to MK minus one, then I have to have an equal probability of going the other way around. In other words, uh, we don't we want our change to behave uh, sort of normally. We don't want loops to be creating. We will be able to backtrack our path, etc. If we do that, then the theory uh, says that uh, we'll be drawing from the posterior distribution. So we have to be careful in choosing our proposal distribution. So in this case, uh, our proposal distribution could be many things. It could be adding uh, a new fault object uh, randomly. Uh, 
for removing a fault object this is often called a burst and death process uh, or modify a fault object or move a fault object that is existing so these are if you if you think about objects these are sort of the four movements or changes you can make so all of these changes are reversible uh, in other words uh, you can go back to the old state uh, and you could do that with equal probability and so uh, there's a lot of theory around that again we're not going to cover that in this course but the paper has some clues on, on what this essentially means so once we've uh, defined our, our proposals, we can then uh, calculate our likelihoods uh, and start iterating uh, over, over this chain. So in this iteration, we have to be careful, as I mentioned, to assess properly convergence. Uh, there's a lot to talk about that as well. I'm gonna go uh, mention this uh, in great detail at all. Um, there, are there are ways of monitoring uh, the chain and see what happens to certain properties of the model uh, whether these properties uh, start to have certain uh, fluctuations that are now stationary, et cetera. Uh, one of the simple ways is to look at acceptance rates. Um, what we don't want is our acceptance rates to be very high or our acceptance rates to be uh, very low. Very low acceptance rates uh, means essentially uh, that you're not creating any new many uh, models that are going to be put in our pool. Their high acceptance rates often means you're just reverting back to approximate base computation, so you're not being very efficient. So, um, so uh, what we're creating, therefore, is some some uh, sort of zero correlation in our chain. We have to worry a little bit about the startup part or the burning part, they call it, is that uh, we have to wait a number of iterations, as you notice, because uh, there's a part where the first part is essentially the initial model is still sort of felt. Uh, and so we don't want our chain to be dependent on the initial model. And that's one of the properties of the Markov chain Monte Carlo that we'd like to see. And so uh, here we see that uh, after a while, our acceptance rate is sort of in this region of 0 0.4, 0 0.6. And it has been suggested that that's a reasonable acceptance rate for Metropolis sampling. Uh, and so there's some theoretical reasons for that as well. Okay, so once we're sampling, we get many samples from the posterior distribution. And so these are many samples. You notice here are the red is the partial fold interpretation. So we get a whole diversity of samples uh, that is present. And so that uh, presents now our posterior distribution. So finally, we'd like to evaluate uh, what our posterior uncertainty, what impact that has on, our, on some kind of key decision variable. So here we have a summary variable of the reservoir connectivity. So remember that if you have many faults, then uh, what I'm doing is basically cutting up the entire volume into many disconnected volume. So if, if I have many faults, I will have a high frequency of, of low connected volume, and that's what we've shown here uh, at the bottom axis. So um, if I look here, for example, uh, we see that we have sort of three peaks here, uh, which is uh, some around 5%, some around 20%, and some around 50%. And so if I just uh, take, do many perturbations of the initialization. So I, I do an initialization, perturb the models a little bit, and basically I'm getting mostly, um, because I have only four faults there, I get mostly high connected volumes. And that's what we see here. If you look at the prior distribution, uh, we see that indeed um, our prior distribution shows that we also have this low connected volume because in the prior distribution, we have anything from one fault say to to seven, eight faults. And so then we're creating many more compartments and we have a higher probability of this uh, disconnected volume. And so this is also represented in the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution, we get the same, essentially the same thing. And so uh, that means our posterior distribution also honors our prior information about the possible presence of a disconnected volume. And so, uh, so that's an important uh, thing to have because essentially this is what you can determine uh, how we extract these resources. We just do a uh, simple interpretation, uh, we are overestimating the degree of connected volume. 